could. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll just wait a couple more minutes here. I see the uh, participant list is filling up there, so I'll just give people a chance to filter in. I think, uh, I think everyone is here now. Um, so welcome everyone. This is our, our second Weather Station apps and website training session. My name is Thomas Harrington and I am the Agriculture Technology Specialist with Perennia. And joining me here tonight is my colleague Hugh Liu. Um, he's the Wild Blueberry Specialist with Perennia and uh, he'll be helping answer, uh, helping with the Q&A session and uh, he'll be chiming in to uh, hopefully uh, help answer some of your questions. So feel free to type things into the chat or Q&A and Hugh will uh, keep an eye on, on that for me. And uh, he'll, uh, yeah, he'll uh, be helping us uh, through, through the evening, so. So a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. So this is a Zoom webinar. So automatically your audio and video are turned off. And to ask questions, you can type them into the chat box. So depending on your setup, that might be at the top or the bottom, and uh, you'll see a chat or a Q&A box. So if you type them into the chat, they should be visible to everyone who is here on the session, or if you type them into the Q&A, then uh, they'll just be visible to, to Hugh and I. So two options, depending on how you wanna ask your questions. You can also request to be unmuted um, if you'd like to verbally ask a question. So you can just, uh, there's a raised hand feature, I think, here somewhere, or you can just type into the chat function if uh, you have a more complex question that you'd like to just ask verbally. That's an option as well. So this session will be recorded, and typically within a couple of days, it'll be posted on the Perennia YouTube channel. And to all the regist registrants, I'll also circulate the, the direct link to the webinar as well. So I've got quite a bit of material to, to cover today, and this is just a little bit of a, an agenda to, to kind of keep me on track. Um, so basically we'll go over, uh, just do a, a station component overview, just to go overview the stations that uh, we have through this program, understanding some of the sensor readings, as well as a bit of the maintenance that you can do to your station. And then I'll switch over and uh, I'll do a screen share on my phone, as well as the website, and we'll do an overview of some of the, the apps and website tools that are available with these weather stations. And that will be the, the sort of live demo piece. And I think at the end, we'll have sort of a QA and a question that if anyone has anything that wasn't answered during the session, um, I'll leave it wide open. There's plenty of time here. I'll stay on as long as you like to answer any, any of your questions. And I'll try to leave some room at the end of each piece that if you want to ask questions at that point, or just feel free to type them into the chat and we can address them when there's, a, when there's an opportunity. So this uh, the session here tonight is tailored towards um, producers who have purchased purchased weather stations through the provincial funding program, and so this packages was was purchased from Perennia, and we did the installation on all these components. And so essentially, what the package includes is a Vantage Pro Two Grow Weather Cable Weather Station, and so these are all the Davis Instruments components. So that's the manufacturer of these weather stations. So it includes the weather station. It also includes the cellular gateway, a wireless node, um, a leaf wetness sensor, and a soil moisture sensor. So those are all the physical hardware components. On the data side, what's included are any of the activation fees, as well as the cellular data plan for five years, and that's with the 15-minute 
update interval. So the services provided by Perennia through this package are the siting visit. So I've met with many of you one-on-one -on -one, um, to check out the locations for your weather stations. We are doing the installation and this includes all mounting hardware and material that's all supplied during the installation, as well as a one maintenance visit in the first year. So that's sort of a general check of your, of your weather station, make sure everything looks good um, and we'll replace any components that need to be replaced under warranty or anything like that at that time as well. And also there's ongoing support provided by myself as well as any of the other perennia crop specialists on, on using the data and the systems. As far as data collects, collected, um, it's all of your, your typical meteorological type weather measurements. So there's air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and wind direction, rainfall, barometric pressure, solar radiation, leaf wetness and soil moisture. So these are all logged and transmitted every 15 minutes um, as part of that five-year cellular data plan. And producers do have the option to purchase additional sensors under this program, and a number of producers have already done that. So if there's a specific parameter on here that you don't see that you would like to have measured in your, in your crop, there's quite a number of different sensors available. So this might be something like soil temperature, which is not included in the base package, but you have the option to purchase that additional sensor. Um, it'll be at your cost outside of the funding program, but we can assist in getting that installed on your station. So other data that you might see um, in the data that are not, um, are not physically measured, but things are calculated by the weather station might include evapotranspiration. So that's a, a calculation of the water that's lost from evaporation. And there's wet bulb temperature. Um, so this is temperature, including evaporation, um, wind chill, which is your temperature and wind, a heat index that uses temperature and humidity. And another one that you might not have seen before is this THSW index. So that is basically a, a combination of wind chill and heat index. So it combines temperature, humidity, sun, and wind and index to basically give you another measurement of what your, your feel like temperature, I guess, would be if you take all those parameters into, into account. And then of course, there's also dew point, which is the, the temperature at uh, the temperature the dew will form at. So if you haven't seen one of these weather stations up close, um, on the top right there is the actual weather station itself. Um, so starting from the top down, this big sort of black unit here uh, is your, um, this is the, the, the rain tipping bucket. So inside of here is a little spoon basically that every time um, a, a calibrated amount of water passes through the system, uh, the spoon will basically tip and dump water out of it. And then every time that tips, that's a measure of, uh, of rainfall, how much rain has fallen and collected through the system. So you might see some spikes around the top there. Those are added to the system just to, to try to prevent birds from landing on top of the weather station and, and uh, fouling up the, uh, the instruments. Um, on the top left here, that is the solar radiation sensor. This panel is, is just sort of a connection panel. There's a small, um, circuit board in there that all the components plug into and on the base here with the with the uh, radiation shield is your air temperature and relative humidity sensors and down here with the large solar panel is the cellular modem so essentially all that's in here is a large battery plus um, a cellular modem that actually has a sim card very similar to what would be inside your cell phone just a little bit bigger and sort of more robust and built into this unit is actually the barometer. So if you see barometric pressure measurements with your weather station, they're actually measured within this unit. And so outside the frame of this photo, if you went up the post, you would see the, uh, the pole for the wind meter, which is, um, does wind speed as well as wind direction. So this is a setup in, in a vineyard. Um, you can see the complete package with the pole on top with the wind vane giving your uh, wind speed and wind direction. Um, so total, it's about 17 feet tall. That's where the wind is measured at. So that helps to avoid any local disturbances on the ground. So for example, this is an orchard. This would be up above the trees to give you a, a true measurement of what the wind speed is. 
and the actual weather station itself is uh, it's about six feet, five or six feet off the ground. And here's some photos of other setups in uh, in an orchard, and on the right is in a wild blueberry field. And so when you look at the data from all these systems, they're installed as consistently as possible. Um, so total in this first round of the program, we have 56 weather stations installed currently. So if you look at the data from any of the stations, they're all installed with the exact same setup, the same components, uh, roughly the same height off the ground, as much as we can get them five or six feet, um, as well as the wind meter is uh, it's about 17 feet off the ground. So included in the package is this wireless node, and uh, this is sort of what it, it looks like here. So this is mounted very crop specifically, um, so the setups look quite different depending on, on the crop setup. So basically what this is is a wireless communication box, and you can connect up to four sensors into this box, and you can actually have up to 32 nodes communicating back to one base station. So with the package, there's just the one, the one node, but there is the option to expand your uh, your network down, down the road if you wanted to add more nodes and more sensors. So as part of the package, all of the stations have leaf wetness and soil moisture. And as I mentioned, some producers have opted to put on an additional air temperature sensor or soil temperature sensor have been the, the two most common. Um, but producers who might be irrigating, they might want to have an additional soil temperature, so, soil moisture or soil temperature, depending on what they're doing. Um, at different depths or, or different locations and things like that. So it's, a, it's an easy way to sort of expand the locations that you're collecting data with your, with your weather station and have it all come back to that, uh, to that base station and still accessible remotely. So as I mentioned before, it can be quite crop specific. So on the left here is in a field that uh, will be planted into strawberries and on the right is in a wild blueberry field. So the leaf wetness sensor here is sort of mounted within the, the crop canopy. So I'm going to go over the soil moisture sensor in a bit of detail. So it's it's likely the, the one that uh, the data is a little bit trickier to interpret. So if you're not familiar with soil moisture sensors, there's a few different types of them. And this particular model measures soil water tension. And so the actual sensor itself is just on the bottom of this PVC pipe. So when we install them, we add on the PVC pipe to help protect the wires as it's inserted into the soil and also to make it easier for you to, to remove if you need to pull it out to do any, any type of uh, tillage or things like that, or depending on your crop, if it needs to be mowed, like in case of wild blueberries, you can pull the sensor out and it won't damage the wires. So as I mentioned, there's different ways to measure soil moisture. Um, so this measure, measures soil water tension. And so essentially what this is, is the force that's required for plant roots to extract water from the soil. So you think about the plant roots are trying to uh, basically suction water of the soil into their plant roots. This sensor gives you a measure of how hard they have to work to extract that moisture out of the soil. And so it reads in uh, center bars is how uh, sort of the default measurement, or you can uh, you can set it to measure in kilopascals. There's different units that you can set depending on uh, what you're most familiar with or what charts you want to use. And so the one thing that I, I want to cover is that to interpret these readings from the sensor, it needs to be based on a soil texture chart. Um, so when we did the uh, the site inspection for each of these weather stations, I took a soil sample, and we worked with our soil specialist, Kate McCaver to do the analysis on these samples. So it, it took quite a while, so I apologize in the delay in getting the results back to producers, but I do have all the samples run run now, or sorry, Caitlin has all the samples run and I've compiled them into a spreadsheet that I'll share here in the next, uh, the next day or so. So I will share this, what your soil texture is, and I'll also share the chart that goes along with it to help you interpret your readings. So just a little bit of background on soil water holding capacity and texture. So why do we need a chart to actually interpret these readings? So the primary reason is that different textures of soil hold moisture differently. If you think about a sandy soil versus a clay soil, they're going to hold on to water differently. So it makes sense. Clay tend to be heavier and wetter type soils where sandy tend to be a little bit drier. 
So sand, sandy soils tend to have low water storage, but most of the water that is available, sorry, most of the water that is held in that is, is quite plant available. Where a loamy soil it also has high water storage and most, water, most of the plant water is available versus a clay soil where there's high water storage, but most of the water is not easily plant available. So this will make a little bit more sense here in this next chart. Um, so if you think about um, a soil like a sponge, if you fill it up with, with water to the point that it's dripping out and you let all the, the free water drain out of the sponge, that's your field capacity. So that would be the blue line here. So you can see um, a sandy soil can hold much less water than a clay soil. And this brown line on the bottom is your permanent wilting point. So if you think about your sponge and you squeeze out as much water as you possibly can from it, um, all the water that drains out is your, your, uh, your plant available water essentially. So what's, what's left in that sponge that you can't squeeze out anymore is what's left after the permanent wilting point. So you can see in the sandy soil, there's not a lot of, not a lot of water left over, but if you come over to the clay soil, if you squeeze out all the water that's possible, or if the plant extracts as much of the water as it can, it can get out of the soil, there's still actually a lot left that's very tightly held within the, uh, the clay particles. So essentially there's much smaller um, pore openings in the clay soil, so it can hold water much more tightly than a sandy soil. So that's sort of in a nutshell, sort of why we need to interpret these readings differently. So, um, the amount of force that's required from a plant root to extract water out of a sandy soil versus a clay soil or loam is going to be a little bit different. So hopefully that's not too confusing, but that's a little bit of background that will help you understand why, why we need these readings interpreted based on the chart. Um, so basically, what is your available water depletion? So if I go back over to this chart, so from here to here is how much water the plant actually has available um, to it at any one time in the soil. Um, so you can see in the sandy soil, it's, it's quite a small range versus a loam, has a big range of water that's plant accessible versus the clay. It holds a lot of water, holds a lot of water. And there's still quite a bit available, but not as much as the loam. So basically this range from here to here is your uh, amount of plant available water. So in general, um, if you think about it in reverse, um, what is your available water depletion? So this is actually the amount of available water that has been removed. So zero to 10% means that a soil is essentially saturated. So a 0% available water depletion means that there's 100% available water. They sort of will total, total it to 100%. 100%. So zero to 10% 10 means your, your soil is in, gen, in general quite saturated. Um, 10 to 50% means that uh, there's still good plant water available. And if more than 50% of the available water has been depleted, then as a rule of thumb, sort of generally your plants may, may begin to be water stressed. And these exact values will depend on your crop stage and crop type and things like that, of course. So this is the chart that I'll share with everyone. So hopefully that makes us all a little bit more clear why we have these different um, curves and things depending on your soil texture class. So basically all it comes down to is your, your weather station will give you a measure of soil water tension in centibars. So if you look at this chart on the left here, that's in centibars. And along the top here is your available water depletion. It goes from zero to hundred percent. So basically what you need to do is you need to look at the reading from your, um, your soil moisture sensor and find it on the left here. And then you're gonna draw a line over to your soil type. And then you're gonna draw a line up and that's gonna tell you what your available water depletion is. So where I said, generally um, zero to 10 is gonna be saturated. 10 to 50 is gonna be pretty good plant available water. If you're getting below 50% available water depletion, that's when you might start to see your plants suffering from, from water stress. So this is an example, if you know that your soil type is a sandy loam and you go to your weather station app and you see that the sensor is reading 30 centibars, you can pull up this chart 
find 30 centibars, draw a line over to Sandy Loam, draw a line up to available water depletion. And this chart tells you that you have roughly 42% available water depletion. So that means that 42% of the water that is available to the plant in that soil has been, has been depleted. And so from there, you can start to infer um, if you're irrigating sort of where your optimal irrigation range is, at what reading do you want to trigger irrigation and what reading do you want to, um, to stop your irrigation at. And so there's also ways to sort of field validate this. Um, you know, you could check your app after really heavy rain and see what your, what your reading is and you can kind of calibrate that to know what your, your saturated soil is. Or if there's quite a dry spell and you know that your soil is really dry, um, you can sort of um, calibrate it that way to uh, to what you know, what you kind of observe in the field and what makes sense for your soil texture class. So the other one is the, the leaf wetness sensor that's on the node as well. Um, so if you haven't had any experience with these before, um, generally they read on a scale of zero to fifteen. So zero being dry and 15 being wet, it's sort of an arbitrary scale, but basically um, there's a circuit port here that kind of has a, an intermeshing pattern of, uh, of contacts. And if a droplet of water bridges those contact, contacts, um, the sensor detects that as resistance and that's what changes the reading. And basically if there's a lot of resistance from, from soil or from moisture on the sensor, and that's going to be uh, a measure of 15 for very wet and uh, a dry sensor is going to be B0. So there's not a lot of, I would say, um, basically there's not a lot of uh, uh, discrepancy in there. In fact, in, if you have a seven, is that less or more wet than the 15? Um, Generally, they tend to read sort of dry or wet. Um, it, it's hard to, I guess, to, to degrade into say like what's less wet or more wet. I would use them more as like a as a as a yes or no sort of type type sensor is sort of what what we've been seeing. Um, I mean, if you have a very light dew or something like that, you might see uh, a lower reading. But typically, if there's any sort of rainfall or anything like that, you're probably going to see it read read fifteen. Um, so just as a quick example of how you can use the sensor. So in wild blueberries, there's quite a good, uh, quite a good model for monolinear blight infection periods based off of wetness duration. Um, so this is a chart that's fairly, um, it's used quite frequently in, in the industry. And so it's actually built around um, wetness duration and mean temperature. So this is a great example. If you have one of these sensors in your field, you can start building charts and things around uh, this data that can help you to estimate what your um, infection risk might be, um, depending on your crop stage, of course. So if your crop is at the susceptible stage and you have the, um, the weather conditions that go along with it, then you can start to make some management decisions based off of that. So just for example here, um, this is a custom graph that you can make with these weather stations. So the green line here is leaf wetness from that leaf wetness sensor. So you can see, as I mentioned, they sort of go to zero to 15 quite quickly. Um, so this could have been a heavy dew or something like that in the morning or overnight that caused the sensor to, to give a high reading. So basically what I did here is if you take the start time of this wetness period and you find sort of the end, end time of the wetness period, period. Um, in this case, it was about 12 hours. And if you take the average temperature, which is the blue line during this period to be 10 degrees Celsius. And if you flip back, back to this chart here, um, 10 degrees Celsius mean temperature during the wetness period and your wetness duration, in this case, it was about 12 hours. So that puts us into the, the high category for, um, for a monolithic infection risk period. So that's just one example. Um, of course, there's other other models and things like that for other crop types and diseases, but that's one that uh, has been used quite frequently in this region. Another one is uh, growing degree days. And so um, there's many different ways to calculate growing degree days as well. Probably the most basic and well-known is, is using this formula here. Um, so that's calculated using your daily high temperature plus your daily min temperature 
and you divide that by two and you minus your base temperature. And so the base temperature is going to be set depending on what your um, what you're looking to model. So if that's crop development or insect development, excuse me, or weed development, whatever it is, are going to have a different base temperature. And so that's a minimum temperature required for development to occur. So for insects, for example, it might be 10 degrees. So if the temperatures, if there is a growing degree day below 10 degrees or your, your average temperature for the day is below 10 degrees, then you may not see any development occur with that, that pest or whatever you're looking to model. So basically it's important to uh, match the way that you calculate your growing degree days to the way the model was developed to make sure that everything uh, matches. Um, as I mentioned, there is different ways to calculate growing degree days. Um, this is probably the most common, so just double check, make sure if you're going um, to use some modeling based on growing degree days that you do calculate them um, using the same, the same formula that uh, was used to develop the model. This is one example of how growing degree day, growing degree day use, can be used for cereal, cereal crops. Um, so this is a model that shows growing degree days versus development. So it's a way to sort of model where your crop is in the life cycle um, based on using these growing degree days. So in this example, the base is 4.4 for winter wheat. It might be different for different varieties and things like that. And so in fact, this one does use the daily max and daily min divided by two minus the base. And so that calculates uh, your growing degree days for one, one day, one calendar day. And you basically add those together as you go, go through the season to give you an accumulated growing degree days that helps you track um, where you are on the development of this, this crop. So as I said, it can be used for crops, it can also be used for insects and things like that. So now I, I thought I'd cover a little bit of a basic, uh, or go over a, a bit, some of the, the basic maintenance items um, with these weather stations. Um, so basically there's, there's not a lot to it, um, but there, there is a few really important items um, to pay attention to. So basically the key owner maintenance items are listed here. Number one would be to clean the rain collection bucket strainer. And I'll show a diagram of that here in a moment. Number two would be to clean the tipping bucket mechanism. So that's actually nestled within the weather station itself. You need to remove the, uh, the collection bucket and uh, clean that mechanism. Number three would be to clean away insects, uh, nests, and webs. So spiders like to get in there and make spider nests. Um, I haven't seen any, any wasp or hornet's nests yet, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if they, um, they get in there as well. Number four would be to clean away vegetation. So it doesn't have to look like a, a lawn basically around the weather station, but as long as you can keep vegetation cleared away from it enough that it doesn't interfere with any of the, the readings. Number five would be to change the, the D cell batteries in the node. Um, so those D cell batteries are actually more of a backup. Um, the solar panel on the unit powers a, a lithium battery that's recharged and the nodes are, are backup. So it's just sort of a good practice to change those about twice a year. And number six would be to rinse the solar panels if they're very dusty. So if you're located next to a road or a dusty field or something like that, you might want to just keep an eye on those solar panels and, and just give them a rinse off now and again if they, if they get very dirty. So in each of the weather stations, if you reach your hand down inside, uh, there'll be a, a strainer like this. So it's just a, just a regular sink strainer. So you can pull that out and just give it a, a wipe down, pull out any leaves or sticks or anything like that that might be accumulated on it. And it goes in like this. Um, so there's a few sort of plastic brackets and things in there that uh, it won't fit in the other way. It'll have to fit in uh, like this. And if you look down inside of it, you'll see that it fits right in there just, just perfectly. And so to remove the collection bucket, um, if you reach up and you hold on to the top of the weather station collection bucket and you turn it counterclockwise, if you just give it a sharp twist, it'll spin and then you're able to pull it up and uh, you can remove it carefully. And so you can remove the strainer at the same time if you like, and this will give you access to the actual tipping bucket mechanism inside of the, um, inside of the rain gauge. 
So this is a top-down view of what it looks like. So on the left, you can see that there's quite a bit of debris. Um, I'm not sure if these are insects or what they are, but uh, this was an image that was sent to me. And you can also see there's a lot of sediment accumulated inside of that tipping bucket too. So that's definitely going to affect your reading. So if there's a lot of sand and things in there, that's actually going to change how much water is required to tip that uh, tipping bucket. So basically this little unit here, it's going to fill up with water and then it tips and it dumps out the side here. And there's a sensor that measures that every time it tips. So um, if, this, if this gets full of sand or something like that, that's going to change what's actually uh, required for water volume to tip that bucket. So it's important to, to keep that nice and clean as well. So on the right is, uh, is what it should look like. So um, the best, bit, best way would just be to sort of wipe it out or you could get a um, spring a water bottle or something like that with you and sort of rinse it out from, from the inside. So as I mentioned, uh, keep vegetation cleared away. This is definitely an extreme example, but it, it was uh, an example from, uh, uh, from our, our region. And so you can see these vines, they, they do grow very quickly. So um, if these get up and they kind of get tangled into the, uh, the rain collection bucket or sort of if they get up inside the sensors, they could change, uh, they could definitely impact the, the readings that you're gonna see out of this system. So it's important to keep all that cleared away too. So as I mentioned, you don't have to keep it perfectly mowed around the station, but uh, just try to keep the vegetation in check sort of around, around the base. Um, another important one is around the leaf wetness sensor is to, to make sure you keep vegetation and leaves away from it as well. Um, so that I showed the photo of the, the circuit board. So if you have something like a, a leaf, especially if it's wet, if it hangs down and touches that circuit board, it's gonna change the readings. So it's important to keep that all cleared away as well. Um, depending how it's mounted in the crop in the vineyards, a lot of them are actually within the canopy here, like in this case. So just keep an eye on them and try to make sure you keep the vegetation cleared away from them as much as possible. And one thing I want to mention when, when you're doing your maintenance, um, this unit here, this is a top-down view of the solar radiation sensor. So just make sure that you don't touch this, uh, this white part right here. So this is actually a filter um, that helps ensure accuracy of the measurement. So if you touch that with your hands, it could be oil or dirt or debris that uh, could um, foul up the filter there. So just be careful when you're working around the weather station not to touch that unit there. So changing the no batteries, as I mentioned, um, sort of spring and fall would probably be a good time to, to change them. If you're bringing this in for the winter and you're not collecting any data with it, then you might not want to bother with that. But if you want to get like soil temperature or air temperature from the node over the winter, you might want to make sure you do have fresh batteries going, uh, going into the winter. So it's very simple to change the batteries. There's two latches on the side here. So just pull those um, briskly and uh, just pull them towards you and the whole unit will open, open right up. So this is what it looks like when it's opened up. There's a plastic cover right here and you'll see the batteries in behind it if they're installed. And there's two sort of clips right here that you can push up on and the cover will come right off. And then you can just pull out the old batteries and put new ones in. So they're, they're, uh, it takes four D cell batteries. And so there's a nice diagram that shows you which direction to put them in. Um, and so, yeah, just make sure you, you get them put in the, the right way. There is a recommended component replacement schedule. Um, so this is not, it's not required. This is uh, what we develop based on the manufacturer's recommendations. So as I mentioned, the D cell batteries um, roughly twice a year. In the weather station itself, there is a temperature and humidity sensor. Now it says two years, but that is sort of a preventative maintenance um, interval. That doesn't mean it's gonna fail or give you incorrect readings after two years. But um, if you want to ensure you have accurate readings, that would be the recommended replacement schedule. There's a lithium battery in the node and it's about two years on that recommended. The wind sensor is about four to five years and the rest of the components are 
uh, roughly five years. So all these components are, are available directly from Davis. If they do fail past the first year, you can buy each individual component as, as required and they're fairly, fairly straightforward to replace. And uh, I grabbed these examples. Um, sometimes the best maintenance can't prevent everything. So um, this is just a nice storm that we had over the winter and this weather station uh, went into low power mode and stopped reporting. So I went out to check it out just because it was a new install and I was kind of wondering what was going on. And uh, as you can see, there's quite a bit of ice and snow built up on the solar panel. So in this case, there was no, there was no data lost. It just went into low power mode and it wasn't transmitting for a couple of days once the ice melted and the battery powered up again, then it all, all called in and all the data was still there. Just another example of what it, what it looked like on the node. So quickly, I'll go over the different, um, the different ways of accessing the data. Um, I want to leave quite a bit of time for the live demo at the end. So I'll go, I'll go over this part fairly, fairly quickly. But basically to access the, the data through these weather stations, there's two apps available to you and there's also one website. So hopefully everyone has a chance, has had a chance to download these two apps and play around with them and go on the website as well. So basically what I'm hoping to show you is which tool you use for which purpose, I guess. Um, for most folks, I think the apps are probably gonna be the, the easiest and fastest way to access the data, but you'll see on the website, there's um, there's some powerful features there as well, depending on what you're looking to do. So if there's something that's not available on the app and you're wondering how to do it, more than likely it's gonna be on the website. So if there's anyone on the call who, who, uh, who didn't purchase a station through the funding program, all the data through these stations is publicly accessible as well. And probably the easiest way again is to get it on the Davis Weatherlink app. So you can go to weatherlink.com and create a free account. Um, you can also just download the Weatherlink app to your phone and you can make a free account there. So you can open up the app and there's a search function there where you can search for um, weather stations. And so something to note is um, all the weather stations installed under this funding program use this naming convention. So if you search under the search bar and you notice a weather station that is named like this, for, for example, Glen Home, and then in brackets, NSW, and then some numbers. Basically, this is our way to identify. Um, it's a unique identifier for every station so that we can keep track of which is which. Um, for example, in some communities, there might be four weather stations um, in the valley. For example, there's some weather stations quite close together. So instead of naming them, I guess, with a firm name or something that was a personal identifier. Um, we've chosen to use this naming convention, so NSW, and then there'll be a, a, a couple numbers after it. So if you see something named like that, that means it was one of the stations under this funding program. So I wanted to mention that the data is also publicly viewable on the Cape Breton Mesonet. Um, so Jonathan Buffett with the Cape Breton Mesonet has been a great partner under this project. He um, did a lot of training up front and has, has been helping to support us through this program as well. So any of the stations that we install, he has also included those under the, the Cape Breton weather page. And so this is what it looks like. It's probably the, the best and easiest way if you're curious to see where all the stations are at and able, and if you would like to access the data live, um, you can click on any of these stations and a name will pop up and you'll see if it has that naming convention, you'll know that it was one of our weather stations under the, the funding program. So you can see there's quite a number of them through the valley as well as through uh, Northern Nova Scotia. And so that website is capebrettonweather.ca. So it's a pretty easy one to remember. I definitely encourage you to go, go check it out. There's lots of really great information there. There's a few features. Um, there's a historical view. So if you want to look at past data, for example, you can see if you want to know where a frost was overnight in which parts of the province, um, there's the ability here to do daily um, highs and daily lows. And uh, um, you can also, uh, like I said, yeah, go back to different days. And if you want to know what the daily high or low was for a particular day um, and, and view it across the entire province, then that's all available there.
So the Weatherlink app, so I will do a live view of this, but essentially um, what the Weatherlink app is for is uh, it's weather focused only. Um, it is publicly accessible. Anyone can create a free account and it's where you're going to go to view real time data from from your station. And it's very simple, very easy to use. Um, it doesn't give you the same in-depth data that you can access from the, the Weatherlink website, but it is going to be that really quick and easy way to access your data that's going to be, you know, in, in your pocket on your phone at all times. Um, you do have the ability to do daily and historic highs and lows and averages and things like that right on the app. Um, so it does have some of those features, but if there's anything like a custom custom chart or a custom report or anything that you want to do um, sort of more in depth, that's going to be on the, the Weatherlink website. And the other app that's available to producers who purchase weather stations. So anything I talk about in this app is not publicly available. So either the station owner um, will have access to this or someone who has been shared access to a weather station by the station owner. Um, so what it's used for is you can generate things like wind and rain alerts from your station. You can do temperature alerts, frost warning, growing degree days, chill accumulation, and soil moisture monitoring. So it's quite, um, it's quite a bit more in depth and there's a lot of customizable features in, in this app. But as I mentioned, it's it's only available to the, the weather station owners. And it's it's very agriculture focused. Whereas the the Weatherlink app, it's it's strictly weather. There's no um, sort of agriculture focused components built into that necessarily. And so this Weatherlink uh, website, and this is showing a bunch of screenshots that I'll go through in, in my live demo. Um, but basically that's weatherlink.com and you log in using the same login info as you do for, um, for all the other apps and tools. And so as I mentioned, um, we've just finished up the installation. So we have 56 installed across the province. Um, these green dots show where they're all installed. And this is a close up view of the, uh, the Annapolis Valley. So you can see we have a pretty good distribution across the province. And some of you might be aware that the, um, the funding program was reopened for applications. It just closed here at the end of April. And uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture is in the process of reviewing the applications and sending out um, approval letters to producers for those stations. So we're looking forward to having another batch of stations. Um, those will hopefully be going out later this summer, maybe early fall, um, depending on when we can get the, the applications all approved and the stations ordered and, and shipped up from Davis. So we've got some pretty good coverage now. There's Lots of really great information coming in and we're looking forward to sort of filling in some of the gaps here that we have um, under this program. So that's it, that's for, for my, uh, that's it for at least the first part of my presentation. Um, I saw there's one question come through here, I'll take a look. Oh, perfect, that was you, yeah. So capebrettonweather.ca, um, tons of great information there. That's all publicly available, there's no, um, no login or anything like that required for, for that website. So you can, you can head there anytime. If you purchase a weather station through this program, it is, uh, it, it's on there already. Um, we, we make sure we get that all set up at the time the weather stations are installed. So is there any questions on, on any of that so far? <laughs> I don't see any questions at this moment. Okay, perfect. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a screen share from my phone and hope this works, so bear with me.
Is that, uh, is that working, Hugh? Yeah, that's working. Okay, perfect. So this is a this is a screen share from my phone. So I've got the two the two apps loaded on there as I mentioned. Um, so the first one will be the the weather link app. So if you click on that, and um, if you haven't been on here before, um, this is what it will look like. And I would have sent you an email with your username and login information. If you haven't purchased a weather station through this program and you want to just make a free account, you can just sign up here. Um, it's totally free. There's no no uh, no subscription or anything required to access the data. So under login, I've just made a generic account here that I'm going to log in with. So if you have your own login information, you can type that in there now. So when you first log in, this is what your um, your home screen will look like. So your weather station should already be located there. And if you have more than one weather station, they should already be um, pre-populated there as well. If you're just making a free account, you won't see any there, um, but you do have the ability to load in and save as many stations as, as you'd like to view. So as a general orientation on the top right there, there's an icon that you can tap on. You can see your name and uh, login information and things like that. And one thing I want to draw your attention to are the units. So if you click on units, you can change any of these measurements. So if you like to see rain, rainfall in inches instead of millimeters, you can change that right there and then that'll switch everything over in your app. So um, also any of these measurements, if you'd like to see wind speed in uh, miles per hour or, or knots or anything like that, there's lots of different options you can pick for units. So if you hit the arrow, arrows on the top left to go back to your, your home view here, um, there's a couple options to add more stations. Um, at the bottom, there's sort of a shortcut there where you can hit find more stations. And what it's gonna do is to bring the location from your phone into the app and we'll bring up the, the closest available stations to uh, basically to where you're located. Um, so for me, there's a few here in this area that I can see and, in, and you notice they all have that name and convention with the community name, community name and then NSW and then some numbers. So those are all stations that uh, we installed under this program. So if you want to save them, you can just hit this flag button to the left and they'll change to green. So you can save as many of them as you like. You can save all of them from your local area. And for example, if you hit a flag next to one here and then you come back to your home screen. So the home button is on the top left. You'll see here that uh, um, there's one, uh, another one added to the screen there. And so if you want to add a different one, come back to the home screen, you'll, you'll see it there. And so you can also hit the plus sign if you like. That's another way to add more stations. So you can do location results. And that's also going to bring your close uh, location in from your phone. And you can zoom in and you can see different different weather stations that show up there. And it's gonna be similar to those ones that were already shown, but if you tap on any one of them, you'll be able to see it in the current conditions. And there's a flag there that you can turn them on and off. So if you hit that flag, it's gonna save it basically on your, on your home view. And if you zoom way out, it's gonna, whoops, it's gonna to start to um, clump them all together, but you can keep zooming in and they'll slowly start to spread out. So if we go into the valley here, See, there's quite a quite a few of them, and if you tap on any one of them, um, you'll see it show up there. And then, if you want to add that to your home view, you can do that by just clicking that flag. One thing to note is that this all the stations on this app um, they may um, they may be public stations. Um, by that, I mean anyone who buys a, a Davis Instruments weather station can add it to this app. Um, so that's where I want to differentiate. If you're looking and you see this naming convention, you, you'll know that it's one of um, the stations under the funding program. Um, but there's some other ones here. Um, this station, for example, doesn't have that naming convention. So this would just be a private 
um, a private weather station that the owner has decided to, to load onto this app for um, just for, for public data access. So just keep that in mind is um, they may, may or may not have been installed using the same parameters as, as uh, we use for our installation. So if you're trying to compare data with those stations, just, just keep that in mind. Um, they could be fairly accurate. They may not be depending on, on how they were installed. So if you want to go back to your, your main view there, you can just go back to your homepage. And if you click one of those weather stations, then you'll see your nice, uh, your nice summary. So it gives you your current conditions as well as your highs and lows and all that nice uh, um, just general weather information that you want to see when you click into the app. So you'll see the, the forecast here. And uh, so this, this isn't through Environment Canada. They have their own weather forecasting um, service that they use. So I guess you'll have to see how accurate that is for, for your region. I've heard it's been pretty good. Um, it, may, it may depend on, on where you're located, but uh, it, it doesn't go into as much detail as what some of the other forecasting services might use, but uh, it does give you sort of a prediction for your 24 hour uh, rainfall, chance of rainfall and things like that, daily highs and daily lows. All right, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, Diane's so since you're on this page, Diane's wondering if there is a weather plating capacity with this unit. Uh, I answer yes, since you are, you are on the screen right now. So it gives you seven days forecast and with temperature and cloud coverage and et cetera. So do you want to explain it a bit more? I don't know. I don't think the website gives you this, only the app gives you this function, right? That's right. Yeah. So this forecast is only, it's only in the app. Um, in the other app, the Mobilize app, it does give you things like a frost prediction and it does use, um, it sort of uses some prediction, prediction modeling for that as well. Um, but yeah, this is, this is all it will give you for the forecast. And as I mentioned, it's not quite as much details Environment Canada, but it does give you an hourly summary. And so this takes into account the exact coordinates of, of your weather station. And yeah, that's a great point to use that this is freely available. So anyone can go on and, and pick any of the weather stations from the area and get a, and get a forecast using this app. So as you keep scrolling down, there's a lot more information here. So um, temperature, humidity, wet bulb, dew point, uh, wind chill, and heat index. So that THSW index, as I mentioned, is temperature, humidity, um, solar radiation, and wind. And so it's another, it's just another way of, of uh, calculating a, a feels like temperature, I guess. So it takes all those parameters into account. And it gives you your uh, uh, temperature graph for the last 24 hours, and you can scroll left or right. And if you tap on any of those points, you can see what the temperatures were. So for example, this is the Glenholm weather station. There was a, a bit of a frost last night, so you can see the temperature dips. And if you click on that point, you can see that it actually got down to minus 0 0.4, right around 6 a.m. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll see your rain accumulation. So it gives you your current 24 hour monthly and year rain. So keep in mind that the year rain will certainly be based on when the weather station was installed. So if it was only installed a month ago, it's not gonna account for anything that, uh, that was before that point. And uh, similar to the temperature, there's a rainfall graph here that you can scroll left or right. So that white line is your monthly accumulation. So if you had a rainfall, it will bump it up and you'll also see a little bar graph down at the bottom um, when that rain occurred. And this one here is great for, um, great for spraying. So this is uh, your 10 minute average wind speed and your high wind gusts, and then also your current, current wind speed. And it also gives you a, a wind rose to show you the pre predominant wind direction during the last 15 minutes as well. And just like all the other uh, modules there, you can scroll left or right, and it will give you your highs and lows for, for the hour. So if you click on any of these points, I guess uh, not for this one, but uh, if you slide left or right, you'll be able to see um, the hourly average, which is going to be in the white, and the high wind gust is going to be in the, the blue bears. 
And then the barometric pressure that can help alert you if there's changing weather conditions on the way, if that's, if that's rising or falling. And you can also see a chart here. And to uh, the solar radiation. So as I mentioned, the, that sensor is used to calculate um, evapotranspiration. So it estimates how much water is being lost for the day based on uh, the solar radiation and the temperatures. And same thing, you can scroll left to right and you can see when, when the highs and the peaks were for, for the day. So this part that says extra sensors, um, that is what's actually coming from the node. So you see it says Glen Home and then it has the station identifier and the node. And so leaf wetness sensor, it tells you the current reading in this leaf wetness minutes. Um, what that refers to is over the 15 minutes that it's been recording before, uh, since the last call in, how many of those minutes was the sensor wet? So it's a little bit confusing because the scale for leaf wetness is zero to 15 and the reporting interval is also 15 minutes. So if you see 15 and 15, that means the sensor was wet for the previous 15 minutes, if that makes any sense. So if, if this only called in once every hour, um, which they, they don't under this data plan, but if they only did call in once every hour and it was wet that whole time, then you'd see 60 minutes. Um, so if you see 15 and 15, that's what that's referring to. And the soil moisture sensor um, is reading 30 centibars. So that chart that uh, I showed earlier, and I'll send that around in the next day or so, um, look at that chart, match that up to your soil texture, and that will tell you the available water depletion for your soil. And um, this node in, in particular also has a, a temperature probe on it, which is a soil temperature probe. And so that's telling me what the, uh, the current soil temperature conditions are. So if you have additional sensors, they'll show up here in the, the other ports. So each node can have up to four sensors. So in this case, we could add another one on if we wanted to. And you can also see daily highs and lows. So if you want to know what the high soil temperature was for the day and the low, um, you can see those there. Or if you had another air temperature sensor, you could do the same thing. So some producers have put another air temperature sensor in a low lying area where they are concerned about frost risk. So you can see exactly what time um, the low temperature occurred on that, that point. So down at the very bottom, you do have the opportunity to actually filter by, uh, by year, by month, and by day. So here's if you want to know what the, uh, the temperature was on a particular day. I'm just going to go back and just pick May 8th, for example. That happened to be a pretty cold day in Glenholm. So it got down to minus 5.9 at 6.15 a.m. And the high temperature was 12.6 at 4 p.m. And uh, depending on how you set the filter, so if you just exit out for day, now that's giving me the temperatures for May. If I exit out May and it has 2022, then that gives me the, the high temp and the low temp for 2022. And you can act, also go back to 2021. This station was, uh, it was only installed in December. So that's as far back as the, the readings go. So that's a quick way if you want to be able to compare year to year and it says all time records. So if you want to, once you have additional years of data, you'll be able to compare year to year quite easily um, right from there. So that's it for the Weatherlink app. Is there any, any more questions on that before I switch over to the, uh, to the other app? So the other app um, that's available is this Davis Mobilize app. And so I'm just going to log out here because um, I've got a couple of different accounts, but I'm going to use that training account. So it looks just the same as um, the other login page. So use, use the same login that you have. And so this is the page that you're going to see. And so you can create lots of different views. Um, so why you might want to do that is if you have, for example, multiple nodes in one field. So if you have different blocks, so you might want to have block one, block two, or field one, field two, however your farm is set up. Um, if you just have one weather station, it's going to be easy. You're just going to hit add view and you can call it home farm or whatever you like. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just a way to keep track of things. 
So here's where you can actually set up all these customizable parameters based on your weather station. Um, the first one I'm going to pick is frost. It's an important one this time of year. Um, so you're going to pick your, your device. And if you just have one station, it's going to be only one option. So in this case, I have a temperature probe on the node, which is my soil temperature, but I don't want to use that one. I want to use the one that's on this Davis Instruments Grow Weather. So that's the actual weather station unit itself. So I'm going to pick that one. And if you hit next, it's going to ask you what you want your frost threshold to be. So um, maybe some crops are a little bit frost tolerant. You could put that down a little bit lower. But if you want it rate at zero, you can leave it there at the default. You can have an early warning. So if you want to see a notification in the app um, a little bit early, maybe 1.5 degrees, you can set that there. And you can also use it based off of wet bulb. Um, some producers might be more familiar with that than others, but basically wet bulb is if you, um, if you take a wet, a wet rag and you put it on around a, a thermometer, basically, um, it accounts for the evapotranspiration or the evaporation heat losses from, from water. So if you think about water on your skin, as it evaporates, um, it takes heat with it and it makes you feel cool. So if you have, um, a plant leaf or something like that that has water on that's evaporating there's it's the temperature is generally generally going to be a low a little bit lower than a, a typical uh, temperature reading that doesn't take into account um, any moisture so if you're familiar with that you can use it or you can just leave it and skip it and that completes the frost setup so it turns orange uh, or yellow uh, right now on this app because uh, actually there is a potential frost for tonight. So this is a great, a great chance to walk through this. So it's forecasting for this Glen Home Station that there could potentially be a frost uh, tonight occurring at 6 a.m. And uh, it gives you your forecasted low. So it's forecasting it's going to get pretty close. So if you're going to do any frost protection, you might want to be prepared. And beside the wrench icon, there's also a little graph. And on the left is your actual measured temperature. So we saw last night it did get down to about minus uh, 0 0.4, minus 0 0.5. And then on the right is the forecast for the, the next couple of days. So you see there that it is forecast to get down to, to, uh, to right around the frost threshold. So that's a, a very useful one. Uh, the next one below it is um, you can set up different weather parameters that you might want to mo uh, monitor from here as well. So you can pick your station just like before, and there's lots of things that you can set up here. So this might be applicable if you want to use this for, for spraying. So you could maybe you want to see a 10 minute average wind speed alert. So if the wind, the average wind speed maybe is 20 kilometers an hour, you can set this for whatever you like, but that's just an example. Um, also, if you have a, a high wind gust, maybe of maybe 30 kilometers an hour, depending on, on what you want to set here. You can also set daily rain alerts. I'm just going to skip these for now. You can also set high rain rate alerts. So um, if there's a really severe downpour and you want to have a notification of that, you can see that there. And a high temperature alert. So maybe if you are using this for spraying and you want to stop when temperatures reach um, 30 degrees Celsius, maybe your product label says to not apply above a certain uh, temperature, you can put that in there as well. And a low temperature alert. So this would be separate from your frost alert. So if you want to apply, um, for example, some pesticides work better at, at higher temperatures above 10 degrees, for example, you can set that in there as well. And so that gives you another view under your frost view. And so if you hit these little arrows, that'll drop everything down and give you a lot more information. So it'll give you your 10 minute average wind speed. And so if any one of these were um, exceeded your thresholds, then this whole region would turn red and it would give you a notification. Um, it would just pop up here sort of on this app view that one of those readings were exceeding your thresholds. And there's also a sort of a chart here, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but basically this is your actual temperature versus your highs and lows. So the, the red is your actual and predicted, 
And on the top is your actual high temperature and your pre predicted temperatures. And the, the blue below is your, your low temperatures, as well as rainfall and things like that. Um, so there's the ability here to set up your, um, your growing degree days. Um, so you can pick different crop varieties if you want, just to keep track of what you're setting up. And you can pick your temperature sensor and uh, your weather station unit like you did for the other ones. And you can pick your growing degree start date. So um, we've been doing some work with wild blueberries where the start date is April 1st. So you can set that. The next step is your growing degree day target. So some crops, this might be a little bit different. So um, you might require a certain number of growing degree days to reach maturity, for example, uh, or if there is a certain number of growing degree days required for an insect's life cycle, you might wanna set that as your target. Um, for wild blueberries where they're a little bit different, um, what we found is if you put it for a low number, so if you say put it for 250, the app will stop calculating at 250 and it won't calculate them anymore. So you're better off if you want to monitor it for the long term for the entire season. You can put quite a high number in there and then it'll just continue calculating them. Um, there are a few different methods here for calculating uh, growing degree days. And uh, as I mentioned before, you, you, you want to make sure this matches up with the model that, that you are using. There's a little question mark here that you can find some more information on how to use them. And once you hit next, um, this is where you set your lower temperature, um, which would be your base temperature. So wild blueberries use uh, are using zero for some of the models that, uh, that we're working with right now. And if you want, you can have an upper temperature threshold. Some pests might not, uh, their growth stage might not change past a certain high temperature. So you can just skip that if you like, and you can also set up a chill, chill date. So this is important for, for some of the, the fruit crops. And you can skip the rest of that if you like. So what, what it will do is calculate um, your current growing degree days. So the model that you're using, you can match up this growing degree days with your, with your model. And it also gives you um, an estimation for the growing degree day accumulation for the next seven days, as well as the previous seven days. So um, it's definitely an estimate. Um, all these models, they, they certainly need to be um, locally validated. So I mentioned wild blueberries. There's some good work being done right now to help validate these models. And they're, as I said, different ways of calculating growing degree days. So we're in the process of, of trying to, to make those more accurate. So um, the tool the tool is there. Um, I would say it's fairly limited in what you're able to do in terms of customization, but it is there and it might be a useful tool for you um, for some of your crops. There's one here for irrigation. And I would say this one is the most complex. I'll go through it very quickly. Um, once you have a chance to, to look over the charts that I'll send later, you're, you'll likely have more questions and feel free to, to reach out anytime. Um, but basically you'll pick your um, soil moisture sensor that's on the node. And there's lots of options here to set thresholds and things like that. Um, and these are all gonna be dependent on that chart, as I said. Um, so the center is you'll be able to use your chart to figure out what is your saturated point on your field. I'm going to throw in some, some numbers here just to, to, uh, to use as examples. And the wilt threshold, that will be um, at what point the, uh, the plants will wilt due to um, underwatering. So there's some more information here that you can, you can look up um, at the top here. It gives a little description about what, what each of them mean. So a stress threshold, this might be at the point where you want to start irrigation. And you can add in other things to an irrigation system here as well, a pressure switch and a flow meter. I'm just going to skip over those for now. 
And so this is an opportunity where you can um, see what your current soil moisture is. And then if you hit this little uh, graph button at the top, it sort of starts to color code everything there now um, based on the, uh, the parameters that you set up. So what, what, what is your saturation zone, your stress zone, um, what is good soil moisture, what, what is your wilt zone and things like that. So as I mentioned, those ones are definitely going to take a little bit more to figure out what you want to set for your parameters. And it's the kind of thing where you can validate it, where if you know at what point you want to trigger your ir irrigation based on um, based on field validation and things like that, you can come back in here and actually adjust all those, those numbers a bit later if you like. And there is an IPM function in here. Um, that's an additional subscription that's not included. And uh, we decided not to include that in that package because a lot of these uh, models and things haven't been locally validated. So they are in there. Um, as I said, we just we don't know how accurate they would be in, in our region. So that, that was why they weren't included under this, this package. So if you see that there, that's what that means. Any questions on, on that app? I don't see any questions from the attendance here. Okay, perfect. So if there's no questions there, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll switch over to the website. The website there. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to go to weatherlink.com, this will be the page that you'll see. And just like the other apps, you can type in your username and password, like I'm gonna do here. So this is the main the main view that you're gonna see. Um, all this stuff is is customizable it's a lot to look at sort of when you first get logged in here but if there's anything that you don't like you can hit the x button to get rid of it you can also click and hold and shuffle things around if you like to see maybe your temperature here um, right at the top left when you log in and you can scroll up and down and see all these readings um, it's just sort of a nice quick snapshot of what's going on with your with your weather station so if you own multiple stations or if you've saved different stations, you'll be able to change over here. So if you've gone in your app and you've saved different stations, you'll be able to see those there under saved. Or if someone has shared access to a weather station to you, um, you'll be able to see that there as well. So if I want to go into this Brooklyn Corner weather station, the page will refresh and it'll give me all this, uh, the same weather information like I saw for the Glen Home Station. One thing I did want to uh, point out here that you might not see very easily, if you click on the shares and uploads, this is a, where, a way that you can share access to your weather station. So basically anyone from the public can view the current conditions of your weather station, but they don't have full access to the data. So for example, if you're working with an agronomist or a trusted advisor or somebody like that, do you want to give them full access to your data? Here's where you can come in here and you can actually add a share and you can just type in that person's email address. So if they've made an account, um, they can just log in and they'll have access to your data as well. Um, but here at the summary page is what I wanted to point out. So um, what this does is this generates a really quick link for you to be able to come back and uh, just, um, you can bookmark this page. You don't have to log in to view it. You can share this link to anybody that you want. Um, it's a really quick and easy way to just simply have this up on your browser. So maybe you make this your homepage. When you open up your weather, um, open up your web browser, you'll see all your current weather conditions for your weather station. So you could just right click on this and, and you could hit bookmark it or add it to your favorites tab or something like that. So back into the Weatherlink website. Um, and feel free to stop me at any time if you have any specific questions. Um, I'm just going to go along this, this uh, chart here uh, or this tab here up at the top 
And this is going to bring you into your charts page. And as I mentioned, this is where you can do any of your custom graphs. So if there's anything that you um, want to see that wasn't available in your app, this is probably where you're going to be able to do it. Um, so if you already have some graphs made there, you can just hit the X button and you can get rid of them and start from scratch. On the right hand side here is where you'll be able to drop down and see all of your different parameters. And so they show up as three bits like this, three different um, options, because this is the uh, this is the cellular modem, which, as I mentioned, measures barometric pressure. This is the weather station itself that does your temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, all that sort of thing. And the third one down is going to be your node. And it says, if you just hover over it, it says Glen Home node. And this is where you'll see your leaf wetness, soil moisture, and temperature are all going to show up here. So I'm just going to make a really quick, simple graph here. I'm just going to do temperature from my weather station. And like I said, if you just hold your mouse over here, you'll be able to see it actually gives you the, the model number of what the weather station is if you actually want to look it up and see more information about the, the sensors and things like that. So if you hit update, then you'll see all of your, um, your information is going to show on the graph here. You can give it a title if you want. And this is where you, you would come and change your start date. So if you wanted to see um, the previous week temperature data, you can just change that and it's automatically going to update your graph. You can go back a couple weeks or years or whatever you want to do. You can change it to uh, anywhere from an hour to two weeks. And one thing to keep in mind, if you go longer than two weeks, it's actually going to give you daily totals and averages, and that's to give you a much cleaner looking graph. So for example, if we go three months and we go back to March 1st, for example, you see it smooths out all of the data and that's because it's giving us our daily, our daily average temperature. So it's not giving you all those highs and lows like you saw on the on the one one week graph or daily graphs and things like that. It's actually just giving you your daily um, average temperature. So it'll look a little different depending on the, the the range that you go with your data. So you see this is much more detailed. It's giving us all of the weather station information updated every 15 minutes. So if you hold your mouse over any one of those points on the graph, um, it'll automatically update and uh, and show you the temperature at that point. And so you can do this with temperature, you can do this with rainfall, any of the information that's collected in the weather station. Um, so this one is with rainfall. You can see the little peaks and if you hover your mouse over it, you'll be able to see um, what the totals were. And so each one of these little bars is for 15 minutes. So if you want to get in and see a little bit more information, you can go to a three day. And so you can see exactly when the rain fell. So um, I showed a custom graph before of leaf wetness versus um, versus air temperature. And this would be another way to, this would be where you'd come and, and plot all this information. And you can click on any of the um, parameters, change the colors of them. It's really customizable. You can make the graphs bigger or smaller. You can add multiple graphs. Lots of options there. I encourage you to go in and, and play around with that. Um, moving along on the top where it says data. This is where you can come and actually view the, the raw data that's coming from the weather station. So on the left, you see it's updated every 15 minutes with a date and timestamp. And same thing, you can do one hour, one day, two weeks, um, as far back as you want. You can pick different start dates based on the calendar. And most important here, I think, is your data export button. So if you want to put this into a spreadsheet to do some custom processing or calculate growing degree days or whatever you want to do, um, you basically type in your email and you hit send and it'll email you an Excel sheet of all this data. And that might be a great way to back up the data just so you have, have a copy of it on your, your desktop as well. It does give you a really nice monthly summary page here that I, that I really like. And you can actually hit the print button and it makes a really nice PDF that you can save a copy of this as well. So it gives you a breakdown of your, your daily highs and lows and averages. And uh, basically just a nice summary of all your weather conditions for that, that month.
So that might be a nice one to, to save as well. It puts it into a PDF format so you can save that. And uh, moving along quickly, and we're getting to the end of the time here, and I want to leave lots of room for questions, but there's also a map view. It's just the same as what you saw on the app there. So you can zoom in and see all the stations. You can click on them and see the station name as well as the current temperature and uh, a summary and things like that. So the mobilize here at the top, um, you actually can't make any changes here. What this does, it just shows you what you previously set up on the mobilize app. So it's another quick view of looking at your frost duration notebooks, um, your weather, weather temperatures that you set up like with your 10 minute average wind speeds, as well as your growing degree days, irrigation and things like that. So basically all this pages, it's a bigger, a bigger view of what you previously would see on your app. And uh, you just can't make any make any changes to it. If you want to make any changes to this mobilized information, you'll have to do that from from the app on your phone. So what I'm going to do now is come back to this bulletin page. And um, one thing I want to go over, it, it's a little bit tricky to find, but if you want to set up text and email alerts to your phone. So if you want to use these weather stations to to get an actual text alert to your phone, for something like a frost alert. Um, that's what, what I'm gonna cover here now. So on the right-hand side, um, if you drop that down, that gives you some more options and there is a gear icon here. And if you hit this gear icon, it gives you in uh, a lot more information here where you can make changes and things like that. Um, please don't change anything on, on the settings or anything here. Um, you can change your, what, your account email uh, password, sorry, uh, you can change your account password. Uh, we have a generic, generic email set up, just allow us to tie them all together. If you do change your password, just let me know what it is. Um, the reason for that is it helps me troubleshoot any problems. And also as we develop more tools, um, we're hoping to connect all these weather stations together into um, a few different platforms and um, we need the password to make sure we can get those all connected. So feel free to change the password if you if you like, just uh, just let me know if you do so that we can make sure you stay connected to all the tools. So if you come in here to the settings, um, so hit that gear button and you can come into alarms. So here's where you can set up what you want your alarms to be. So any of these parameters here, you can make into alarms or alerts that you can get to your phone or email. So probably uh, most commonly people are gonna wanna set uh, an outside temperature alert. So if I wanna get a text alert at two degrees um, to trigger me to start thinking about uh, doing frost protection, uh, I can set that here. Um, I already had, had it set for two degrees. I'm gonna change it for three just so that uh, I can show you where to save it. So if you change it, uh, basically, if you change it to a new measurement or if you put something new in here, say we put 30 degrees for a high temperature, for example, come down here and, sit and hit save, and then it, it'll all be saved. So if I want to go back and if I want to delete that out of here and I want to put two degrees back in there, uh, come back down and hit save. And so if you have a node, it doesn't uh, show up right here. It actually, you have to drop it down and uh, here's where you can set alarms based off of the node. So if you have an additional temperature sensor on the node, um, you can set that up here as well. So this is just a soil temperature probe on this unit, but if it was another air temperature unit, maybe I want it to send me alert at two degrees as well, then I can hit save on that. So I'm gonna come back into the weather station itself and Notifications, so this is where you're actually gonna set up how these alerts are gonna get delivered to you. Um, so you, you can actually set up a daily summary if you like. Um, so what this will do, it'll send you an email once a day, whatever time you want, it'll give you a summary of all your past um, conditions. I've been getting those uh, for this weather station. They are kind of nice to see what your daily highs and lows were. So you can turn that on or off here and put in your email and you can tell the system what time uh, you want it to send you that email. But here's where we're actually going to set up the notifications for these alarms. Um, so if you read this, an email will be sent for any system alarm uh, for the following addresses at the time alarm occurs. 
Um, so any of those previously alarm, previously set up alarms here. So if the system hits two degrees Celsius, and we come here to email notifications and this is turned on, it's gonna send me an email um, when the system goes past two degrees. And it'll also send me another email once it rises up above two degrees um, to tell you that the alarm is concluded. So the email function, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. This text function is a little bit more complicated. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna share my screen and I'll ask you to, uh, to just get out a pen and paper and write something down here. So depending on your cellular provider, if you would like to set up text alerts to your phone based on any of these weather station parameters, um, find your cellular provider in the list here. And if it's not in the list, just reach out to me afterwards and I can get it to you. And write down this, um, this code right here. So up the top, this is my cell phone number and I'm with Bell. So this is what my address is gonna look like to get these alerts sent to my phone. So basically you put your full, um, your full cell phone number with 902 in front of it, and then put the at symbol, and then this, uh, this address behind it. So mine's 902-324-8255, and I am with Bell, so mine's gonna be at txt.bell.ca. Um, so for example, if you were with Eastlink, be the same thing, your number at mms.eastlink.ca. So once you have that, I'm gonna switch back over to the website. And so the reason we have to do that is this is a, an American website. It's an American manufacturer. Um, they don't have all of the Canadian um, cellular address gateways um, listed already. So what I'm gonna do, I already have mine added in here. So yours perhaps will look like this. So you can enter your, um, uh, you'll see here, they already have some US addresses added in here. So AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. So we don't have those available in Canada. So that's why we have to go through this process and select other. So that, address I just got you to write down. Um, you're gonna type that right in there just as I showed you before. Um, so mine's 902-324-8255 at txt.bell.ca. And you're gonna hit save. And that's all there is to it. So you can add in as many numbers as you like there and to turn the alerts on or off. So I found when I was first testing it out, I had quite a number of alerts set up for wind speed and everything like that. And I was getting all kinds of texts in a hurry. Um, so it will send you two texts. It'll send you one when the alert is triggered and another alert once um, it's passed. So if that's frost, once it the frost alert based on the temperature that you set is, is passed, then it'll send you another text. So if you find you're getting too many of them and you wanna shut them off, you can just take the check mark, go to the box and hit save. And if you want to turn the uh, text alerts back on, you can put a check mark, check mark there and hit save again. And so it might be something before you really need it, you might want to test it. You could prob probably put in a safe temperature there for 10 degrees or something like that and just test it out to make sure that it, it is working. And uh, like I said, if there, if there was a provider that wasn't in that list there that you need, um, just let me know and we can put that, I can get that information to you. I would say your safest bet is probably gonna to be to set up both of them. Um, basically, they don't make any guarantee that um, there won't be issues. It's worked very well for me in the past, but um, in their uh, documents here, they say email is probably gonna be your most reliable option, but the text um, services, it is there as well. So I like to have them both set up just, just as, a, as a safeguard. So that's, that's pretty much um, what I have for the presentation. Um, I'll open it up here now if there's any specific questions or anything that people want me to go into in more, more detail. I know there's uh, 
a lot of information to cover. And I, I really think the best way is to just start playing around with all these tools. That's the best way to learn. Um, I think in the email, uh, initially I sent around, there was some links to other YouTube videos and things like that from Davis themselves. They might be able to, to provide a bit, a bit more clarity on some of these, these, uh, tools and things like that. But, but yeah, if there's anything in particular, feel free to, to, uh, reach out and <laughs> let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Thomas. I don't see any questions in the chat or Q&A yet. I guess, how, how has everyone been finding the, the weather station so far, people on the call that, that have them? Is there things that you, you like or things that, uh, you could use a bit more clarity on, I guess. Um, I really, we haven't had a lot of feedback from producers. So uh, as far as I know, people are getting along, getting along pretty well with them. I think once you get on, you play around with the apps, it's, it's pretty straightforward. No comments. <laughs> I don't know if you have any ways from your account to turn on anybody who wants to speak. I don't see any button for me to turn somebody's mic on only chat next to the name. Nope, I don't, I don't see any hands raised yeah. or anything, so. Yeah, because we set up this as a webinar, so they only can type questions <laughs> or comments in the chat. But yeah. I know, I know, I talk to many wire blueberry growers, and I think we are getting a lot of benefit from this program and the weather station there. Um, there are a lot of data that we can Correct from the station, but I just we just need to find a way and be be smart to know how to use them, yeah, and to help with growers with their production. Yeah, and, and Hugh, you've been doing a lot of great work with the uh, with the models this year. I think there's a huge potential, especially for wild blueberries, to to use those models and help with uh, help with crop management and pest prediction and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of information now that we have these stations out across the province that we can start start pulling together into, into a really great network. Yeah, um, I think this first year, we just want to get people and everybody to get comfortable and get used to this program and all the weather station. And going forward, I think there's a lot of great potential we can do with those stations and all the data to, um, to do some great things for, uh, for everybody. Yeah, for sure. And, and there's been a few other industries the the Apple producers have been, been doing a lot of great work too with, with modeling and, and things like that. So yeah, I think there's a huge potential for, uh, for using this data to, uh, to make great, great management decisions. So, yeah. So yeah, if there's no, there's no further questions, um, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. I know that was a, a lot of information to take in. And as I mentioned, this will be recorded, um, check back to the Prenia YouTube channel in a couple of days and also, um, I'll also send around the link to anyone who registered for, for the station. So thanks again. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. My email is tharrington at perennia.ca or my phone number is uh, 324-8255. So at any time, if you have any questions at, at all, feel free to reach out. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Great. Thanks, you.